carers are not excessively preoccupied with their rights. I think they're much more preoccupied with their caring. But I think the rest of us uh, have a lot to do to think about how to support them and indeed perhaps how better to establish their rights and certainly um, the expectations that as a society we should hold of ourselves as we think about care and we, 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 we thank and support in better ways in the future those who provide care. Um, it's the day following the spending review and as an all-party parliamentary group we always refrain from being politically partisan but I don't think it would be controversial if I were to say that uh, the spending review is disappointing uh, in relation to care. The Chancellor has found another £300 million for care and he's also authorised local authorities to spend another £1 billion on social care. Um, that's not a, a, a compulsion, it may be an expectation. There may be difficulties for local authorities in managing to do that, but uh, even if we do find that there's 1.3 billion pounds more funding for social care from the public purse, it is still, uh, I think, uh, a very small amount by comparison to what is needed. Equally, I don't think it's controversial to say that uh, we are disappointed that, uh, that uh, this government, like its predecessors, has failed to vouchsafe a new strategy for social care. We were told a little over a year ago that, the, that uh, the government would have one. I think it was going to be oven ready or something like that, but it has yet to be vouchsafed to us. Uh, I think in, in the webinar and the discussion that we're going to have, inevitably we will be talking about COVID and we will be talking about the funding crisis, the endemic funding crisis of social care. But I hope that we will um, focus primarily on the theme that we've chosen for today, care, care homes and the arts and creativity. Uh, and that reflects the focus and preoccupation of this particular all party parliamentary group, which as many of you will know, um, conducted a uh, three-year uh, inquiry into uh, the contribution of the arts and culture to health and well-being in a whole range of contexts, but very importantly, including in the social care context. Some of our panelists were actively involved in, in that inquiry. We published in 2017 a report entitled Creative Health, which has had, uh, I think, uh, a certain impact, and we are following through a 10-point strategy indicated in that document, uh, including the foundation of the, the National Centre for Creative Health, which now has charitable status and has funding for its first year of operation. But all that is by way of background and explanation of who we are. I'm delighted to welcome the first of our panellists, Madeleine Bunting, the author of uh, a number of very remarkable books, but the latest of which is Labours of Love, The Crisis of Care, which many of you will have read. It's, uh, it's, it's an account of the state of social care in our society. Um, it's written with her characteristic journalistic and, and broader authorial skills. It's written with passion, but it's also written with rigour. It's written quite coolly and in a balanced way. It's a marvellous narrative. It's a book imbued above all with grace. I think it's a very beautiful book. I think it's a very important book. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome Madeline and to invite her to address us. I don't know whether she's... Thank you so much, Alan. Unmute. Yeah, I've got there. I got there. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Alan. Um, yes, I, I've written a book called Labours of Love, The Crisis of Care. Um, and to just uh, explain what I was trying to do in my book, because as Alan explained, I, I used lots of the skills that I've developed over the course of my writing career. Um, in part, this is a book of a journalist who traveled around the country interviewing people in all sorts of different co contexts in which they were offering care. So care homes is just one small part of a, 
of a very big landscape that I was trying to describe about the way care works into so many different aspects of our lives and of our relationships with other human beings. And I start from a very simple premise, which is that nobody can afford not to be interested in this short word care, because we start out in, in total dependence on the care of others as small ba babies, as children, as we come into the world, and we almost invariably will need large amounts of care towards the ends of our lives. And frequently at intermittent points through the rest of our life course, we're either offering large amounts of care or we're receiving it. So my, my, my ambition in my book is to reframe the word. What do we mean by care? What do we understand by this word? And I think uh, we have a cultural problem around a sort of invisibility around care. And that's where social care as a political problem, I would argue, has just got completely stuck. Care has been denigrated. It's been understood to be cheap or free. It's been really regarded as, as um, low skill work done primarily by the least qualified, the least educated. Uh, and there is a, a, a kind of um, bias against care throughout our culture, our social systems in every respect. So what I wanted to do was really uh, examine those who provide care, how do they talk about their work? And that's where uh, I, was, I was using my journalistic skills, which was about asking questions and listening to the answers. And uh, I went all over the country, talked to care workers, GPs, shadowed nurses, spent time on hospital wards, went to visit hospices, talked to palliative care, professionals and I asked all of them one simple question what, what is care what is it that you're doing and the answers came back that uh, were so rich and so nuanced uh, and uh, and so full of insight that that really is the, 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 the nub of the book and when Alan very very generously describes the book as full of gr a, a, great, uh, a grace I can only say that that grace came from the people I was interviewing and that could have been very badly paid social care workers um, whether in big cities or in rural areas, the parents of children with disabilities consumed by their, uh, their work of care. And so I just want to sort of summarize some of, my, some of my findings and the ones particularly, of course, which are relevant to your work on the APPG, uh, because I felt that creativity was, uh, was a recurrent theme really throughout so many of the interviews. And one conclusion I came to really quite quickly because it, it was so apparent is how profoundly creative care is and why I think care really needs to be put in the context of one of the great sort of imaginative, creative human endeavours. Uh, some people may become artists, others become carers, but actually they have far more in common with each other than is commonly understood. One of, one of the things that obviously people say to me is, so what's your definition of care? And uh, just very briefly, I think I would sum it out up primarily in three words, presence, attention, and touch. Uh, and, and all three of those, it seems to me, there are many different ways of touching. One is obviously physical, and that can be extremely significant when you're caring for somebody who does not have um, powers of, of, of speech, for example, they may be dying or uh, indeed a child. Uh, and um, attention and presence are absolutely critical. And, and all those three are repeatedly required where human relationship deals with vulnerability and dependence. One of the things that are, uh, uh, became very apparent, I was interviewing a philosopher of care and, and he was describing how he washed his daughter's hair. And it's a very, very moving uh, interview uh, where he described knowing that as she associated touch with his love, she would uh, absorb that embodied knowledge of care, which in turn she would then be able to offer to somebody else in the course of her life. So we learn care through a form of embodied knowledge uh, and it passes in this extraordinarily moving way, really, from person to person. Again and again, people I interviewed would tell me, people particularly in the care, social care workforce would say, I learned it from my grandparents or I learned it from my mother. And they were consciously drawing on that inspiration uh, in their work. So why do I call care so creative? Well, 
one of the things was just by chance, several of my interviewees had either come from a background in the arts or on the uh, had sort of parallel lives, if you like, in the arts. And they often drew analogies between the two. I was very struck in an interview with an intensive care nurse uh, who hopefully has joined us this evening, Tim Owen Jones. And he had begun his career in the arts and he drew this wonderful analogy between his work as an intensive care nurse in St. Thomas's. He's been extremely busy, as you can imagine, in the last eight months with COVID with the work that he did for the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square uh, when he was working for an arts organization. And he was interviewing hundreds of people to identify who should be put uh, on the fourth plinth. It was a project which was about uh, individual members of the public getting an hour on the plinth uh, each. Um, so there would be a continual process of people going on, on the plinth. And he had to work out what they were gonna use that hour for and why. And he said he was gathering such an incredibly rich array of stories. And then he said, that's my work. That's as an intensive care nurse, I'm effectively in that moment of huge sort of significance and, uh, and, and import in somebody's life when it, their life could be hanging in the balance. They are effectively on a plinth in some way because they attract all of our attention, their family's attention, their loved one's attention. And I'm helping the families, the patients themselves, to begin to understand what they're going through, as well as, of course, as providing that clinical competence, efficiency and skill to ensure that their health uh, recovers and, and is mended. So that's one example. Another example, which was very, very interesting, is I shadowed a GP practice. And the three partners, the three GPs, all had very, very different styles of being a doctor. All very, very effective, but dramatically different. And they talked themselves in terms of how it was a form of performance, that in the consultation room, they are effectively performing a version of themselves and the link with their work, with, with a sort of theatrical work was very, very uh, interesting. The GPs also talked about a, a, an aspect of, of their work, which I found very, very interesting. So many, this was a very tough GP practice in a very tough urban area in a city area with a lot of social problems, a lot of deprivation. Uh, and they said something like a half of the people coming to their surgeries have medically unexplained symptoms. There was very little they could do in terms of more treatments or diagnostic procedures. And they felt that often in such circumstances, their work was an act of bearing witness, which is the phrase that John Berger, the writer wrote in A Fortunate Man uh, some 50 odd years ago in the in an extremely moving essay of a GP's work uh, uh, in, in the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire. So the, the reason why care and creativity are so closely interconnected is because they involve so much imagination. Uh, it's in a process of intuitive understanding as to what someone might need. And it's also so often about reframing narrative. And I'm going to pick just one final example from my book. Uh, of an interview with a palliative care consultant from America, uh, who is in the last part of the book dealing with the end of life care. Uh, he was a remarkable individual and you can find his, his talks on, on uh, TED talk on, on, the, on uh, the, the web, BJ Miller, in a tragic accident at the age of 19, he lost uh, both his legs and an arm. And uh, he said, there's always a way to reframe the narrative. And so often the doctors role is precisely that, to help the patient with the story they're telling about their lives uh, and to reframe the narrative. Whatever time they have left, they still have time. Uh, and that seems to me uh, to be a thread that runs through so much of care. It's about forms of storytelling and sharing the stories. Uh, and of course, the care of the elderly so often involves listening to their stories. Um, uh, and that seems to me, as a writer of novels and of fiction, which I am, uh, is, is of course so close to my work, which is all about storytelling. Uh, so those are just a few of the examples that I would pick from my book, which uh, draws those, those, those connections between care and creativity. Thank you, Madeline, for a very rich and stimulating presentation which I'm sure will prompt many questions. And if people want to think about the questions that they might like to put to Madeleine or to any of the panelists and care to uh, 
indicate in the chat that they would like to ask a question, then uh, we will do our very best to get everybody in who wishes to speak at a later stage. I'd now like to turn to Professor Martin Green. Um, Martin has been a very close friend and, and indeed participant in the APPG's inquiry, um, just turned up and joined us and started to play his part and has been an absolutely indispensable member of our advisory group and, uh, and, and a, a fountain of useful thinking. You can see from, from the uh, short description of, of, of some of the things that he's done that I think has been circulated, his biography, uh, what, a, what a remarkable uh, varied career he's had. You will also have noticed that during the pandemic, Martin has been a, a really magnificent standard bearer for uh, the care sector as chief executive of Care England. He's spoken up with great courage and great eloquence, uh, saying things uh, uh, publicly which badly needed to be said on behalf of residents uh, in care homes and staff in care homes and the wider care sector. So Martin, uh, you're very, very welcome as always. And uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much, Lord Howe, for that very generous introduction. And um, I want to talk today about the whole issue around creativity and cultural activities in care homes. And I think in your book, Madeline, you've talked about care in that way of being creative. And I think one of the challenges for the, um, the care sector is to recognise that care is about the human being that we're supporting. It is not a series of interventions or processes, but this is very much about people. And I think one of the things that really came across in your book, Madeline, was that issue about responding to people and to be uh, very focused on making sure that people have a life rather than a series of services. Now, I think creativity, uh, artistic activity in its many forms is very central to delivering good quality support, which is person-centered and which nurtures people from the perspective, not only of their physical needs, but also of their mental health and well-being needs. Now, this has been true throughout the, the time that care has been uh, in its form, in its current form, though, of course, we were quite slow to understand the needs people have for um, their, their artistic needs and for their cultural needs to be taken account of. But I think since the pandemic, it has been even more important and people's mental health has really suffered because of the isolation, because of the fact they have not been able to connect with their communities because of the tragic loss of life in many care services. And I think one of the challenges of the pandemic is to make sure that we hold fast to delivering care that supports people's well-being and supports them to be people, rather than to make sure that there have been a series of interventions done or are we obsess with a range of processes. We must remind ourselves that good quality care is about how you respond to individuals and how you make sure you support their uh, mental health and well-being and also their identity. And so much of our identity is about the cultural activities that we know and love and that have been part of our lives. I think we should also acknowledge that particularly during this pandemic, there has been a need for that support to be offered not only to residents of care homes, but also to their families who have sometimes been very disconnected from them because of the pandemic. And also for the staff teams who have been working so incredibly hard um, and have also uh, shared with the people they support the terrible loss and I think we should acknowledge there have been 20,000 plus deaths in care homes during this pandemic um, uh, but I think we should remind ourselves that if we're going to be delivering good quality care it has to be responding to people's cultural and, um, and emotional needs as well as physical needs. Now one of the things that I think I've seen in this pandemic is the brilliant way that care services have responded and lots of them have really focused on some of these um, artistic activities 
not only because they do improve well-being, but also they've been used as a bridge between the care home and the outside community. And even though people haven't been able to go into the care home, through the way in which people have used cultural activities, they've been able to connect people to families and to other communities. Uh, that's true of things like music. And we've seen some really great innovative ideas. So there was a drive-through music event in a care home in Norfolk where the residents were in their windows and the families were in their cars and they were sharing that experience, albeit socially distant. And what was great about that was the impact it had on residents, on relatives who were able to feel connected, but also on staff who said to me, it was so nice to be thinking about something that was a positive rather than always thinking about the negative. We've also seen some great ways in which um, uh, things like creative writing has been used during the pandemic and the connections that there have been between younger people and older people. Um, and also we've seen a good deal of the connection that people have used writing as a way of showing how they've been resilient, and not only at this point, but also in their past lives. And so that has been another way in which creativity and activity has really helped with the well-being and the quality of life of care home residents. And I know that Hilary Woodhead from the organisation NAPA is on, this, um, is on this call today. And organisations like NAPA have been really great and really creative in this pandemic, enabling people to do things which are nurturing people's creativity and nurturing people's love of the arts but doing it in, in different ways than we would normally do it in situations where we can't get out. It doesn't mean that we can't engage. And I think this pandemic has really opened us to new and innovative ways of doing things. What I really hope will come out of it is that we won't lose those things when we move to a much more normal existence. And it's particularly good to remember that particularly people who might have very severe disabilities and might not be able to get out that much can now be connected with things that they were excluded from before because we've all got much more savvy about how to do that. So I think there are some big, um, hopefully positive things that would have come out of this that will be used in the future because one of our big challenges is to make sure that nurturing people's soul is part of what we do, but also that it's for everybody, not just for those who are able to participate by going out or being part of some uh, particular activity. So I think there is obvious evidence that um, it, artistic expression is so powerful and useful in care settings. There's ample evidence that it has been indispensable in this pandemic. And I hope that it will be a platform for moving us forward into the future and making sure that people understand the importance of creativity and nurturing people's um, uh, enjoyment and, and also their past affiliations with, with, um, with activities that are around arts. Thank you very much, Lord Howe. Thank you, Martin. Nurturing people's souls, their enjoyment, their resilience through the arts, as well as through all the other activities and 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 attitudes of care, uh, so profoundly right. And thank you for, for speaking as you have, and you have particular insight uh, into what is happening across a huge range of care homes in this country. I live in Norfolk. I was fascinated to hear about the, the drive-through music event in, in Norfolk. Um, now, let me turn to uh, Douglas Noble, another old friend of the APPG, who's worked with us over a number of years now, uh, Douglas is Strategic Director of Wellbeing at Live Music Now, an organization that was founded by Yehudi Menuhin shortly after the war and uh, for many, many years has brought professional musicians into care homes uh, with profound benefits, both for the, for the residents and the staff in the care homes, but also for the musicians. Douglas. Good afternoon. Thank you, Lord Howarth. And thanks very much for inviting me to speak here this afternoon. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, live music in care homes for older people and the nurturing of musical care culture. I'm going to start briefly by saying a little bit more about live music now. As Alan said, we're a, we're a UK-wide charity covering Wales, Northern Ireland and England, 
although there's a separate live music now Scotland and we still deliver on Yehudi's vision from over 40 years ago when he set it up of training early career professional musicians across the genres and taking high quality concert hall standard live music to people who wouldn't otherwise access and those access it and those two things support each other as Alan, as Lord Howe said we we specialize in working in uh, care, care settings that includes care homes but also working with older people in community settings and in hospitals and we also do a lot of work in schools for disabled children and young people in 2019-20 which is sort of last year we got figures for we we delivered 3,400 workshops um, across our, our areas and about 1,200 of those were dementia specific workshops with um, around 28,000 older people carers and family members so that involves recruiting and training musicians and we have about 300 at any one time and we very carefully recruit looking for excellent musicianship but also the ability to connect through their music and very importantly we pay musicians at MU musicians union professional rates supporting them to develop uh, their portfolio careers and staying as musicians we we deliver music in, in a range of settings as I said from sort of one-off participatory concerts to extended residencies always interactive and participatory and based on the idea of we work with rather than doing it to. And over the years, we developed a sort of curiosity and a role around how we nurture and grow music in care settings, in adult social care settings. So it can happen between and after our work. And as well as taking a, a sort of role in terms of advocating for that and linking in with initiatives such as this and with uh, uh, care setting bodies such as Care England, um, NAPA, uh, National Care Forum, and then also the, the, care, uh, the Care Quality Commission, um, and we're linking with academia. As has been said, the arts, and, and, and in this context, music, really are about relationship and connection, as well as, of course, enjoyment and entertainment and creativity. They show us something about the things that we share, but they celebrate and uh, share our, our individu individuality as well. And they're about a means of sharing the person and reflecting that person back into his society. So we got very interested in the idea of what meaningful music could bring to the whole of a care home, the culture, the place and the people. How can we nurture and support a musical care culture in settings? And what does that do for, it, for the relationships? And we co-created a study called Live Music in Care with the University of Winchester, MHA and the Order of St John's Care Trust. Um, with a co-created inquiry, which was how does carefully delivered music support settings to be happier places to live and work, care settings. So we had academic, academic evaluation of that from the University of Winchester, and we published in November 2018 um, with Prof, uh, Professor Norma Dakin, Dr David Waters, Kit, Dr Kit Tapson and myself. And the headline recommendation was that carefully delivered music can provide benefits for older people contributing to person-centred care. We generated a range of elements, evidence on benefits of music for the residents around their expression of identity, but also for the staff around their confidence and skills, both in music and beyond, but their relationships, also their relationships between each other and with the residents and their leadership. Leadership in a very broad sense of the word. For example, a, a care worker who was empowered to feel that she could bring in her wider practice of aromatherapy and set up other aromatherapy classes as a result of taking part in the musical residencies. There was also some conclusions on practice for musicians working with people living with dementia. But really what we found is that it embedded music into a, the musical care culture playing a day-to-day -day role in the toolkit of the carers. Um, they talked about, carers talked about resources coming out of those projects for people that both directly took part in and but also for those that saw the benefits of trying it out they talked about how easy it was and how it didn't take time and effort and it's readily, readily available and they talked about how it could be used as part of their care tool bag someone said um, breaking the cycle of agitation uh, and tension when it was needed so the legacy of that for us is really about how we extend and grow that. We were starting to roll that out nationally, but that was interrupted by the pandemic. We bought in a, a musical care bad, culture badge of excellence and we started to train uh, care workers in that. And we were really looking at the role of professional musicians and professional care workers working together, making something they couldn't do separately. 
and really interested also in the, the role of music in the later life experience of people living with dementia around agency, control, connection and creativity. The idea that music as a language, as spoken language, diminishes, bringing something around the potential to develop, not just decline. And the idea that comes from the social model of disability, that we are disabled by our society um, rather than our impairments or conditions. So obviously the pandemic, as everyone has to recognise, has been a huge impact on that. It stopped us going in in person to care settings, but we kept going with a, an LMN online programme and we've got over 70 uh, specially uh, developed pre-recorded concerts. We've got how to do it videos for care staff about making music. We're doing one-to-one -one shielded concerts and Facebook Live uh, weekly uh, concerts as well as interactive Zoom re residencies and we're exploring that live music and care model as we go forward to developing the skills and confidence of the care workers we're working with and for those that can't get online we've been doing garden and courtyard concerts and DVDs. Most recently we've been partnering with uh, Music for Dementia and also um, Playlists for Life, the Association of British Orchestras, Care Quality Commission and National Care Forum, and also with support from Care England and NAPA, to really ask how are people keeping the music going and what is working and what is needed to move that forward. We ran a survey and an open meeting. We had over 70 people on the 20th of October who came together from music and care settings, really to just look at what are the needs. So as we develop programmes, we're doing that in response to what's working and what the needs are. There was a real clear message around the need for simple and clear information and guidance for care workers, support for staff, training and encouragement, and also stuff around tech and digital knowledge and equipment. The big message for us is really there's something around music here that uh, in the particular current circumstances and going forward can help everyone to just thrive as well as not just survive. And actually, those are the words of Liz Jones, the policy director of National Care Forum, who spoke at that meeting. Um, and thank you very much. Well, thank you, Douglas. Again, it's wonderful to hear what your deeply experienced and deeply professional organisation is doing and how you've been able to adapt and still provide uh, remarkable support and, and, and assist development within care homes, development of a, of a musical culture, which strengthens everything that happens within care homes uh, through, through the pandemic. Delighted you're working with uh, Professor Norma Dakin, she's a bit of a musician herself. I, I, is she a drummer? I rather think she is. When she's let loose, she's she was quite a performer. Musical director of the Br Bristol Reggae Orchestra for some time. But no less, no less. We, well, thank you so much. We must, uh, we must move on now, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Angela Awua, who is uh, a social entrepreneur, and a carer with a very distinct experience of caring in her own personal life. We're looking forward very much to hearing what you have to say, Angela, and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Lord Howarth. Um, I'll just explain like what I've been doing and how uh, my personal experience has informed my work and my social enterprise and my masters. So I've been caring for over 10 years for my mum who was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and um, that kind of gave me the passion I needed to start mental health, the arts. Um, I initially, growing up, I had a, I used to suffer quite heavily with, with depression and suicidal thoughts. And the only way I knew how to express myself was through dance. So dance enabled me to express my feelings and emotions because I found it quite difficult to use words to explain how I was feeling. Um, across the years, I started MHTA, mental health, the arts as a platform for young people to express themselves through the creative arts. So that was just me doing events for young people to come on board and showcase their talents and gifts and somehow also like explore their emotions through spoken words um, as well. Um, and I've done a lot of social action things with like the National Citizen Service and with that raising awareness against stigma and discrimination towards mental health by using the creative arts. So enabling the young people to use things like drama to showcase what um, mental health is and how we can support other young people with mental health. Um, over the years, it's changed slightly 
um, from like 2017 because I felt like something was missing. And what was missing was the fact that I wasn't working with carers. And I thought obviously with my own personal experience of being a young carer and a young adult carer, I thought that was the next step for me. So what I did with that was basically create a program that was commissioned by Lambeth Council last year called the Arts Programme. And I used different parts of my life experience to build the programme up. So what I did was use life coaching, use um, CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, and um, creative art workshops. And um, I forgot the last thing, but when I remember, I'll say it. I used it to create a programme that was six weeks and we worked with young carers in Lambeth. And with that, we enabled them to um, create creative coping mechanisms using the creative arts, but as well as that providing a holistic approach to mental health so not neglecting that they need therapy to be able to sh share their emotions oh the last one was nutritional education so i uh, realizing the relationship between food and how you feel and how you think about yourself um and then the other aspects involved personally what my experience has how has that how that has informed my my work and my master's is obviously it's given me the passion and drive to start something for young people and what I mentioned before that we moved from it just being a platform to actually educating, engaging and empowering young people and equipping them to be able to um, stand even though they're going through the most challenging times. My mission has always been to support young people. Um, my background specifically, although I've been a carer, I've lived in social housing, I've lived in poverty. There's loads of challenges I've had to face, including my mum being ill as well. So I always want to ensure that young people have the opportunities that they need to be able to fulfill their best potential. Part of being a young carer or from an ethnic minority background is that I have, um, is that there's not enough awareness of caring. And it's quite interesting that today is Carers' Rights Day because often I've had to ask the question to other carers, did you know that you're a carer? And I mean, within culture, um, specifically African culture, caring is just something you naturally do. So if someone's ill in your family, you have to look after them. There's no sense of this is your title, you are now a carer, you're still sister or a parent. Um, another thing that I have to break down, a stigma that I have to break down um, is the fact that I'm the child looking after my parent and it's not something that is often spoken about. Um, within my culture most of the time it's the parents obviously looking after the child um, so with that I have faced many challenges and also people asking me loads of questions about how do you do what you do even though you are caring and I think with that it's just understanding that if I'm the worst if I'm the one that has to face the punches first let me be the one to face the punches first so that you have a better future for yourself and that for me is just a thread that's gone through all of my work um, with my work specifically it's also meant that it's enabled me and my experience has enabled me to build trust with the young people so instead of coming across as a facilitator or a teacher most of the time they see me as their older sister um, or older cousin as someone that has faced their experiences and someone that they can be transparent to um, which means that often I'm quite vulnerable with my experiences and I share it so that they can see me as a role model and someone that they can look up to in terms of my my master's so I do um I'm work I'm doing a master's part-time in public mental health at Queen Mary and with that I guess it enables me to explore the different research methodologies um, and how to influence health policy and although I've been able to do that with my work in the social enterprise I think I realized through just studying that there's a big gap in research where young carers or carers in general within ethnic minority groups are not being recognized or there's not enough research that explores their journey so part of my my I guess mission is to understand the intersect intersectionality between culture and caring but also infusing my work with arts and creativity um, just briefly I'm going to talk about probably my most challenging and most rewarding um, experiences since I've been caring um, with arts as well. So I guess the most challenging thing is juggling everything at the same time. So I say that because I, as well as caring and do my master's and running a social enterprise, I also work for a funder called Paul Hamlin Foundation. And sometimes when 
things are happening at home, I have to stop and pause and make sure that obviously my mom's being looked after or things are being paid on time. But having said that, the most rewarding part is being able to share my story and being able to educate people about what means and what support you can receive as um, as a result of being a carer. Another challenge has been, um, I guess, the fear of relapse for my mum specifically, um, but also for myself, it's been the fear of leaving home and not knowing like what's going to happen once I leave and I'm at the age where there's lots of big decisions that are taking place where you're considering marriage or your next big break in your career so it's I guess it's understanding the emotional impact and maybe physical impact that can have on me and also um, my mum as well another rewarding thing has been it's given me confidence doing what I do has given me the voice that I need to share my story um as a young person I was someone that was really reserved never really used to speak out about anything and now I'm speaking across different platforms about my experience and also including my research and academic interests as well and um I guess lastly I'll just say winning awards for me it's given me the Assure, reassurance that what I'm doing is the correct thing and that I'm making a change in society um, and just generally like I love being able to I love being able to share what I do but also explore people's challenges with them and ha- help them navigate that and obviously sometimes it's the hardest part is being like letting go of a young person or not having the right support for them and having to signpost them to a different service. So that emotional attachment. But then for me, it's knowing that I was part of their journey and now they have the confidence to go on and do something completely amazing in society. And I've seen that with people who have come to our events um, and they've shared their story, they've sung, they've shared a poem and then they've gone and created other charities or gone on to study um, for me, that's probably the most rewarding of my whole experience in general. Thank you. Angela, thank you. You, you started by telling us that uh, you find it easier to express yourself in dance than in words. Well, my goodness, you express <laughs> yourself brilliantly in words. And thank among you. the many things you had to say to us, I, I was particularly interested in your observation that in, the, in, in, in your cultural media, caring is just something you naturally do. You are not quote unquote, a carer, which mm. seemed to me to tie in uh, very well with some of the themes that Madeline was talking about. So thank you for a brilliant presentation. I want thank to you. now invite Dr. Sara Donete, a social scientist with a background in, in medicine, uh, uh, working at King's College London, to speak to us. Sara. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for inviting me, Lord Howard. Um, I want to talk about some of the work that I have recently had the pleasure of undertaking with um, colleague Alex Mermikides, who um, is here with us and from whom you'll hear shortly, around the role and, and the potential value of theatre and performance-based teaching and learning approaches in the context of the education of both health and social care professionals in, in terms of their undergraduate education and in terms of their continuing professional development. And it was interesting that Madeline Bunting was talking about those three fundamental aspects of care as attention, presence and touch, because in our experience, in our research, uh, these pedagogies, these teaching and learning approaches provide exactly that or help to foster exactly those um, those elements, those dimensions of, of care. Alex and myself have collaborated for nearly two years now. We joined forces when we realized that we shared a strong interest in the use and study of performance and theater-based pedagogies. And we were interested in looking at professionals at the point of care on the front line of healthcare and social care. With our different backgrounds, Alex as a theatre and performance maker and an academic, and myself as an ex-clinician and social scientist, we are currently working to generate insights into existing practices across the UK, across the country, and also to prioritise the research gaps that we think need addressing, with some urgency, I would add. In particular, the main aims of our current efforts, the three main aims of our 
current efforts. Um, the first is to map existing practices, existing performance-based teaching and learning practices and experiences in undergraduate programs, as well as in professional development activities. We know that innovative and carefully crafted practices exist, but we have found out that um, research on these is rather patchy and disorganized. The second um, fundamental aim of our work is to build a multidisciplinary network that would draw together the experiences and ideas of clinicians, educators, students, performance artists, academics, members of the community, and anybody who has a stake and an interest in this field. And finally, thirdly and finally, another aim is to resource and carry out research that would help, help develop, first of all, an appropriate framework for studying and documenting promising approaches but also to build and consolidate the evidence that exists for arts rich learning in, in the care professions. To date, our collaboration has led to an interdisciplinary symposium turned website in March of this year and the birth of a working group that recently held um, its first public event. Our symposium titled Performance for Care was scheduled for March and as you can imagine, had to be repurposed as an online event. Um, we hesitated, we weren't sure that this would be a priority, but actually the pandemic has highlighted to us that the, the, this kind of work, the extent to which performance-based learning can support carers and those in the caring professions, has just made it all the more evident. So instead of a one-off event, we decided to create a website of filmed contributions and resources that would become a platform for generating further interests and facilitating networking over time. This virtual symposium, which had contributions from several experts in the areas of arts, health and well-being, including very kindly from, from Alex Coulter, um, was viewed by, uh, had very positive feedback, had lots of comments, was viewed by, um, is, is continuing to be accessed um, by several people and has brought people together. And it has sort of, it, it paved the way for the birth of the, um, of the working group. This is an, an interdisciplinary working group that recently, last Friday to be precise, um, live streamed another online event, this time called Performing For Real, which explored the overlaps and the tensions between um, clinical simulation on one hand and performance-based um, pedagogies. Um, the event was, was very well received. We, we had lots of questions. It was viewed by over 200 viewers. So we were re-energized by, by all this interest. And going forward, we, um, our plan, our aim, our hope in a way, is to build on the extensive work that the, the all-party parliamentary group on arts, health and well-being has done towards drawing together the evidence of the role of the arts in health. And on, on our part, um, further develop the research and practice of the role of the arts, and especially the performing arts in our case, in care, in the preparation and the development of the workers and all those who work in care. So that is supporting the health, the well being, and the professional skills, because attention, presence, and touch, uh, and caring touch are not just innate. They are, you know, developed, they might be learned from uh, early experience, but they can also be learned and further developed um, through learning experiences in education. And so we would like to develop the research and the existing evidence uh, and build um, a, a solid evidence so that all these workers can provide relationship centered care that um, is nourishing in, in, you know, care is still an interaction, even though we say providing care, there is a response, be it emotional or physical or so we, we think this is a rich a contribution that the arts can make to the learning and the professional development of workers in care. And we just hope to take the work further. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Sarah, for presenting to us. Good to know that you're working, as you put it, with some urgency on developing a, a better framework for 
studying, assembling the evidence, developing the research. Uh, I know, that, and thank you for the kind words you said about the Creative Health Report. And I know that uh, Rebecca Gordon Nesbitt, who was our researcher and drafted that report, who's in the audience this afternoon, will appreciate what you said. Um, and you've already given something of an introduction to our last panelist, Dr. Alice Momikides, uh, who is doctoral program leader at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Alex. Thank you, Lord Had. I'm going to share a PowerPoint uh, just so we have the opportunity to see some pretty pictures. Uh, let me see how that's, let's do that. I promise you it's just images. Oh. How do I make that go over here now? There we go. Thank you. So, um, so I'm going to talk about one example of the sort of initiative that's um, that encompassed by the collaboration I have with Sarah, Performance with Care, Performing for Care. Um, so this initiative consists of a dance theatre performance called Careful that I created in partnership with the nursing school at Kingston University. Um, and it's accompanied by a series of practical performance-based workshops, which now form part of the core curriculum on the adult nursing degree there. As the title suggests, Careful is about care. Each of the five characters, four nurses and a midwife, is put in a situation that stretches their ability to care for one or more of their patients, or to do so without emotional cost to themselves. These are quite small stories. Nurse Helena struggles to keep her temper with the imperious cardiac patient, Mr. Matthews, or Nurse Thalia can't stop worrying about Mrs. Chakrambati, who has suffered a stroke on her watch and has been moved to another ward. The show hones in on the emotional context of care. Former nurse and author Mark Radcliffe notes a fact he claims is overlooked in nursing policy and public debates, the fact that nurses feel. The show aims to manifest these feelings, including the uglier feelings of anger, guilt, exhaustion, that exceed the compassionate care which is often subscribed to nurses. And it often depicts these through physical theater and dance. So the project draws a parallel between the practice of nursing and care more generally and the skills of the performer. So I'm not saying that nurses are putting on an act when they engage with their patients, rather that there's an aesthetic dimension to caring relationships. The orchestration of words, looks, feelings to create experiential processes. That's nursing described by nursing scholars Siles Gonzalez and Solana Ruiz but it could describe theater too. And like performance, care can be beautiful to behold. That point is made by theater scholar, James Thompson. He talks about an aesthetics of care. I know these things through the personal experience of witnessing my brother, then in his early thirties, undergo almost a year of hospitalization and very high risk treatment for a deadly blood cancer. I was his bone marrow donor at the end of that process. In those situations, a particular tone of voice or quality of touch can give us strengths in moments of despair. I don't say this to romanticize care, but to recognize the skill that is involved. Sensing what another person might be experiencing, being present with difficult emotion, knowing what precise combination of actions might shift the mood reframe the situation, enable a hearing encounter. And doing that in the moment, on the spot, with multiple other calls upon our attention. While well, performers spent years training to improvise in that way. In fact, this is where the workshops come in. In these, we adapt the exercises that are normally used to train actors in improvisation, in the interplay of word and look, um, and you see these as transferable skills that operate in a caring context, in nursing care, for example. And so the project is founded on the same concept of care that Madeline 
and the care ethicists before her describe. Care as relational, embodied, affective, and I would add aesthetic, or in Madeleine's words, imaginative, creative. And this counters prevailing notions of care as a low-grade women-only quarantine. That's Jacqueline Rose describing nursing and care more generally or else as the saintly compassion attributed to Florence Nightingale as the lady of the lamp. Those stereotypes undervalue care either by ignoring it or sentimentalizing it. And that might account for some of the cruel under-resourcing of the people who do it. A final point. If we can think of nurses and other care professionals as artists, might I invite you to think of artists also as care professionals. That analogy is very clear for the artists who have stepped up to support people who are isolated and vulnerable during the coronavirus lockdown um, and the report of the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, Alliance um, on those um, itemizes some of the amazing work that's been done there. Um, or those artists um, who've helped me uh, work with trainee nurses preparing for quite a demanding career. I'd always argue, I'd also argue that care suffuses the rehearsal room anyway. Performers, technicians supporting one another in order to engineer kind of uh, risky imaginative lifts in this case. If we're rethinking care along the lines that Madeline suggests, and I strongly urge us to do so, well, let's properly resource its practitioners, those in health, in social care, in informal care, but also those in the arts. And let's do that with appropriate training, pay and recognition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Very good indeed to see what you're doing and how you're working through dance and theatre to help uh, practitioners develop some very down to earth skills, but also greater resilience, greater confidence, and your proposition that there is an aesthetic dimension to a caring relationship, which I think we absolutely agree with. So, and beautifully expressed, if I may say so. We're a little behind on our timetable, but I know that Richard Best, Lord Best, has to leave at five. He may already have left, but I want to invite him, first of all, among the parliamentarians, if there is anything that he would That's, like to contribute to the discussion. Thank, thank you very much, Alan. That's kind I, just to squeeze me in before I have to rush to the next Zoom. Uh, I, um, the sort of special thing I wanted to add was the, the role of the arts in preventing the need for care and support, and preventing the need to go indeed into a, a care home. Uh, I bring the, the perspective of the all-party parliamentary group uh, on housing and care for older people, housing and care for older people, and we, we bang on about the, the value of people in retirement moving into accommodation that's much more suited to their, to their needs in, 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 in older age. And one of those needs is uh, for companionship, for doing things together, uh, for participating in something uh, rather than being lonely and isolated in your own home. And we, we see that, uh, that right-sizing, we don't call it downsizing, we call it right-sizing, that right-sizing as providing the opportunity for people to be prevented from going into residential care very often, and or at the very least postponing that. And I quote as an example, the retirement community that uh, I used to run the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, we built a retirement village to the north of, of York. And the, the people who came, sometimes people who hadn't really been part of a community for years and years and were very isolated and lonely, moving in to uh, what, was very much like freshers week uh, at, at university with everyone putting on the display of the different societies that you could join everybody wanting you to join their society but there was uh, there's the the painting club you know the, there was the, the choir 
there was artistic pursuits were very high on the list of the societies that people could join. And this is the antidote to living alone in an isolated uh, uh, older age. Uh, and preventing thereby the need uh, psychologically and physically uh, for moving on to residential or, or, or care in the home. So uh, love, love the presentations. Many, many thanks to, to everybody. Really inspiring session. I'm sorry I got to, to rush to the next one. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. So pleased that you were able to stay and thank you for those remarks. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's quite a, a, a picture that you conjure of the residents in your retirement community in the Freshers' Week, uh, but we won't necessarily explore that too far. Um, thank you so much. Now, we also have with us Baroness Hollins of Wimbledon, Sheila Hollins, um, former president of the, of the British Medical Association and many other distinctions. Sheila, I don't know whether you would like to say something at this stage. Well, um... I will just try to be very brief, but in my response, I'm responding um, to the wonderful descriptions of care. Um, and I relate to many of them, but actually as a family carer and during the pandemic, um, that's been a large part of my life um, because my adult son with a learning disability is here with us every day. Um, and like so many people with learning disabilities, his his life um, and opportunities have really closed down during the pandemic. Um, and yet um, it's actually um, participatory arts and kind of culture charities that have enabled him to, to have something to get out of bed for in the morning. Um, mainly because he hasn't been too digitally excluded. He's been able to learn how to use Zoom um, and these charities have all been um, off making, you know, offering activities and helping him to belong in ways which have been quite remarkable. So, for example, a drama group, his big love in life, to be doing drama every week with his drama company virtually has been phenomenal. Um, his book club, which normally takes place in a library, reading books which charity I set up, Books Beyond Words, uh, creates wordless books, we found a way to do it virtually. And there are lots now of virtual book clubs where people are able to think about life, ordinary life, challenges in life, but also new books about COVID. Um, but using, but working with artists to enable this to, to, to happen and to stimulate people's imaginations and so on. And the charities that we've been working with have been charities who, before the pandemic, were trying to set up a belong coalition, um, a coalition of, um, of arts charities uh, to try to engage and offer more opportunities um, for people with learning disabilities. So I would just say that a lot of the things that were said about the how care is profoundly creative, how it nurtures people's souls, um, is they apply so much to people with learning disabilities who are the group of people in society that I've worked so closely with over my professional career, um, inspired by my sons, my, my experience with my son. Um, I could say more, but that's probably enough <laughs> as a response. Thank you so much for the presentations. Well, thank you, Sheila, for that contribution. And very, very good to know of the benefits and the opportunities that your son has been able to find during this extremely difficult period. And I love the idea of a, of a belong coalition. I think that's mm. excellent. Um, now, uh, I, I'd like to turn to Lord Ramsbottom, David Ramsbottom. Um, David, if you're here and you would wish to speak to us, that would be great. I don't know whether David Ramsbottom, Lord Ramsbottom, well, is. Well, oh, wonderful. You're unmuted. Well, You've come among us unmuted. Yeah, yes. I, I would just like to thank all the present uh, presenters for uh, that very moving expose. And um, I kept on um, thinking about uh, prisons. Um, and the absence of the arts in prisons. And um, 
um, the, the elderly in prisons um, 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 needing the sort, sort of care that was being provided, particularly. David, as, as a former chief inspector of prisons and as, as chair of the Kessler Trust, you have a, a deep experience in this field. And I know very well that for decades you have been working to uh, try to ensure that there is a more humane regime in prisons and uh, among your many other concerns and activities to ensure that more prisoners have the opportunity to express themselves creatively through the arts. There's that wonderful annual exhibition that occurs at the Royal Festival Hall, uh, organized by the Kersler Trust, of works of art created by prisoners. Um, do you want to tell us any more about, about that and, and any of the other thoughts that today's presentations may have sparked in you? Well, um, I, I just um, um, was so moved by the, the descriptions of caring and what it meant. Um, and um, I would, would like to think that um, the, the same mo motives could be a, a encouraged in other prisoners. Well, that's that, uh, absolutely, and, and that's something that we'll continue to pursue. And you also run an all-party parliamentary group, which is particularly focused on the well-being of prisoners and uh, better uh, policies and a better national performance as far as our prisons and our prisoners are concerned. And there is a web of all-party groups that uh, need to, to, to work, not in a rigid sort of uh, coordination, but nonetheless to, to be in active relationship and learn from each other and support each other, which is what we will try to do. Now, I, uh, we have another uh, 20 minutes and uh, I think we, we have some 42 uh, people in the audience, which is excellent. A few have had to leave, but uh, now is the opportunity to draw people in with their contributions from the floor, so to speak. I'm going to turn over to Alex Coulter to coordinate this because she can see and she can operate the technology rather better than I can. Thank you, Alan. And just to say, um, Sarah Owen sent her apologies. She had to come out because her technology wasn't working oh, very well. Sarah, um, Sarah Owen's MP for Luton North. Yes. Um, we haven't actually had any straight questions in the chat, but please do put them in now or in the Q&A box. But I wondered whether we would like to invite um, um, James Thompson, is it James Thompson? Yes, because he was mentioned by Madeline and by Alex Mamakides, and he's in the audience and he may like to talk. He's, I think, a professor in Manchester. Is that right, James? I can allow you to talk if I can find you. James Thompson. Welcome. If you would like to. <laughs> I would. Um, I don't know if you can see me, but um, uh, oh yes, I, I, my video has just come back, come on. Um, I, I would, well, I was going to say thank you very much to Alex for giving a plug to the work I've done on uh, the idea of an, an aesthetic of care. I mean, it's a very simple proposition that um, care as a practice um, is a craft and we really need to value our carers as very, very skilled professionals. And if we think about care as a craft, we then give them, give carers a, a set of values and uh, therefore a set of training that says they, they should have that craft practiced. Um, and then it makes us think that uh, rather than thinking about artists um, on the one hand and carers on the other hand, we need to develop a, a debate about them, how, how artists can become better carers and more careful in their artwork and how carers can then become more artful uh, in their care work. Uh, and I think there's an amazing conversation and some amazing work that um, carers do in, in that sort of area. Um, but I'm happy to contribute more or less uh, as people would like. Well, we'd be very happy for you to enlarge if you'd like to, uh, to some extent. Don't, don't feel inhibited. 
Um, and uh, my work at the moment is I'm um, I'm just starting a, a new project with a professor of uh, mental health nursing here in Manchester, uh, particularly looking at dementia care. Uh, but I'm sort of interested also in some of the amazing acts of um, uh, creative, artistic, aesthetic care that have happened during COVID. Um, and we should look at the stuff that's happening institutionally, but also um, in communities where a huge number of individuals have uh, uh, contributed uh, care to isolated elders, to people who are um, isolating more generally. And so often the work they do in caring has that sort of artful craft-like uh, element, whether people are baking cakes, visiting, uh, uh, putting things in their windows, whether they're singing on their streets, whether they're clapping for carers. There's a huge sense that care during COVID has that artistic sense. And I think we should celebrate that and realize that there's a real conversation to be had between carers and artists and not necessarily always think that these are two separate groups of people. What um, Madeline had to say in her initial presentation leading this, this, this webinar and what she wrote in her book about the ethos of care, what might be the proper ethos of care, that care is not something that can be or should be bureaucratized or uh, in, in public administration or something that should be commodified in a, in a, in a market. But care is, is, is an ethos, it's an expression of values, it's an expression of, 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 of a healthy culture. And out of so much that's been so distressing and painful during the pandemic, some good things have, have been born, haven't they, or reborn, which include, as you've just now suggested, James, a rediscovery of, of our ability to care for our neighbours, to care for each other in our community. We've had glimpses of how we could be a more caring community. And I think there is a, there is a, a passionate desire that we shouldn't lose that, that better ethos that, uh, has, that has emerged and that, and that, has, that has flamed up uh, all over this country. Um, and of course, we long to get back to something like normality, but we don't want to get back to the old and defective normality, the old uh, mean normality, if you like. We want to carry forward with us um, what, uh, what, what we have discovered in ourselves and discovered collectively what perhaps in, in that uh, very well-known phrase of Abraham Lincoln's, we might call the better angels of our nature and the better angels of our community. Now, who else would like to contribute something? I can see that there's, there's somebody in the Q&A, but Alex. Yeah, uh, oh, well, there is also a question in the chat from Carol Rogers, from, who works at the House of Memories at Liverpool Museums. I can ask Carol to ask her own question if she would like to. Yeah. I'll just see if she would like to. Carol, would you like to ask your question to the panellists? Yes, I would love to do that. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, thank you for the presentation shared. I thought they were fantastic. My question is, how can we work together to influence the wider UK social care community to develop creative engagement and practice as a core resource for the care for, rather than an, an add-on and perhaps sometimes um, an afterthought. I think it's absolutely essential that you know creative practice is a is a given um, across the care community. Brilliant question, Carol. Which of our panelists would like to respond? Um, uh, Lord Howarth, I'm happy to respond to that. And uh, hello, Carol. Great to hear from you again, and the fantastic work you do at House of Memories. I think we've got to get people to understand that this is not an add-on, it's intrinsic to who we are. And I think we have to link it to personalised care so that people understand the importance of creativity, the arts, and, and nurturing our soul, as has been described, in order to make good quality care. So it must be absolutely at the centre of care rather than a, an add-on. I think also, Carol, it'd be really helpful, for example, if we measured success much less in terms of processes and much more in terms of how people live their lives, how they have good 
quality lives, how they have well-being. So I think there are lots of elements that we all need to work together to make sure that you're right. It becomes central rather than add on. I think Madeline wanted to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, I d just picking up, Carol, on your very interesting question, that it becomes a care resource for the cared for. Uh, and, and to add to Martin's um, very important points, I would just say that I think that what's at stake here is that the carers themselves are, are, are regarded as, as artists, but they have an they have uh, uh, um, and they are encouraged to um, develop artistic practices, if you like, so that they then become more confident about offering that to the people um, that they're caring for. And I was very struck when I was in Denmark by the social pedagogy model that they have, which is the, the sort of routine way of training youngsters to go and work with young people or the elderly or, or any other form of social work. And in those social pedagogy degrees, all the students were doing theatre, drama, music and the arts. So the, pedag the social pedagogues themselves um, became uh, trained in, in the arts. And it was a, a, a sort of it's, it's not that, you know, the, the, the relationship of the cared and the cared for, the, the giver and the receiver are both grounded in shared artistic um, processes, whether it's putting on plays together, playing music together. Um, uh, and, and rather than someone not feeling particularly confident about music and being asked to somehow run a music session. Um, so I, I loved one care worker that I interviewed who, who loved opera. And she described how she sat down with, with an elderly gentleman and they listened to opera together. And it was a transformational moment for that, that resident of the care home. Madeline, you mentioned in, in your book that one of those social pedagogy students who'd done a module the social care degree in, in England had uh, encountered a rather different educational experience or a different set of emphases. Indeed, indeed, that's absolutely right, Alan. So when um, these Danish um, <clears throat> students had come to a university in the UK for um, a term and, and were horrified by the way they saw um, social work, which is the closest equivalent to social pedagogy, um, as, as full of a risk assessment and audit. And the idea that it was about developing human potential, which was at the core of their degrees, <clears throat> was nowhere to be found in the UK model. And I know actually that there are some social pedagogy courses um, in the UK uh, that have emerged in the last few years. There are some who are passionate about this model of education. Um, but I do think it would be a terrific thing if it was more prominent, really, in the training systems in the UK. Alex, we have questions in the chat from Sue Flowers, from Elijah Kay. Yes. And from Debbie Kersley. I thought, Eli I think Elijah might have asked a couple of questions. So um, I'm going to allow Elijah to ask at least one question. If you would you like to, Elijah? Uh, yes, excellent. Hi there. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent. Well, th thank you very much. And, and of course, I would be uh, impolite to not acknowledge the, the plethora of talent and just formidable inspirational stories here. Thank you all so much for creating this space to share that. Um, and my question was actually around, um, I can only really speak from my own perspective as a master's student myself, and wanting to get ahead of the curve here in the sense of um, laying foundation for formidable social prescribing programs or novel arts and sort of caring programs. And I'm trying to just understand perhaps an open question, um, but pointed towards Angela, um, more around what would be essential in these programs uh, based on their experience and perhaps um, which, which form of an award might be necessary in order to actually have that as a sort of objective and tangible um, a notification of, of, of your performance. If that Would you like to respond to that, Angela? Thank you. Yeah, I'll try to, um, I'll try and answer it as best as I can. Um, in terms of university students and what my programme specifically did is, so we had the workshops for six weeks, two sessions each week. And before we had our evaluation session, we had a session about application. So that was going back to all the different workshops and asking the young pe young carers, what is it that you took away from each workshop? What do you want us to work on in this session? That way, 
it's not just information going in and out of their ears, but actually we are focusing on one that maybe it's one coping mechanism that they have and helping that develop that and then checking in with them every two weeks to see if they've used it, if they haven't, why they haven't, but then helping them to navigate that as well. Um, and then your second part on awards, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer this correctly, but I think that um, more, it, it depends on the type of carer you are. Let me just say that because people care, um, whether it's physical, mental health and stuff like that. And I think what universities don't always understand is the emotional impacts that caring has on a young person. So because you are indirectly affected, you're not, all, you're not always the person that is looked after first, if that makes sense. Um, so a, an award of recognition, I'm not entirely sure what that would look like. I think that's I, that's, I just don't have the answer to that. But in terms of support, I think perhaps more maybe financial support or more counseling or more flexibility around like assignments and stuff would be more ideal for carers at university. Hopefully okay, yeah, answered. Time for a couple more questions from Sue and from Debbie. Yeah, I was going to let Debbie speak next. She has a question about um, Alzheimer's and dementia and research, which I think some of our panellists could respond to. Debbie, would you like to ask your question? Oh, thank you. Hi, thanks so much for um, the really interesting talks. Um, I just It's just an open question, really, about what we can do. I'm an artist and I care for my mother-in-law. Um, and when I go to these kind of talks, it's just so incredibly inspiring. There's so much incredible work going on, but I don't know how it connects to what's actually available now um, as a standard practice. We seem to need to kind of search these things out and find the different organisations that provide all this, um, these amazing services, but they don't come as a standard. And I, I, I don't really know where to go with that. Um, and I just wondered if anyone had any suggestions about how to kind of um, represent that and how these things can be get integrated really into a standard care approach when someone is diagnosed with dementia. Douglas, you may have um, a response to that. Well, I, I think it's something about um, the language and narrative that we're using through these alliances, because we're obviously stronger together than we are apart. Um, that's definitely something we've learned through the pandemic. Um, but I think the cross-sector organisations and interests and expertise that come together but at this level, but also at, at, the, at the care giving and the creative arts level as well, those alliances where you, you, you take it into a, a narrative of, of value to, uh, and something that's intrinsic as opposed to something, as Martin has said, that's, it's, uh, that's good to add on. So I, I think there's, Deborah, I think there's real hope in, in, in the, the move behind that. Um, and I think these alliances are, are actually starting to bed in the fact that we we have martin and um also we you know the support from people like national care forum i think which are leadership organizations across the adult social care sector i think there's a real shift uh, i don't deny that there's there's obviously you know we'd like to see things going going more quickly but uh, i i feel very positive about it and i think there's a i think we can speak in positive terms about it culture change is always hard to achieve and we always want it to move faster than it's willing to do but uh, that's absolutely right that uh, the objective must be to integrate the arts and culture into into everybody's thinking and everybody's practice uh, where care is concerned to normalize it and uh, we must use all the networks we have it could well be that the culture health and well-being alliance can uh, can help provide a facility to connect people to the services that are available, which are often uh, provided by quite small organizations, even by individuals uh, all across the country. So it's hard to map and, and hard to systematize. And if we systematize, we mustn't, as it were, kill the innovative and creative spirit that goes with it. Uh, and I think this is something that the National Center for Creative Health will certainly wish to think about and and, and try to facilitate. We have um, another question. 
Yes, we've got Sue. I'm going to ask Sue Flowers to speak, but just to say, Douglas, you might want to put the links into the um, Music for Dementia website specifically because that there's a lot of there are a lot of resources there, aren't there? Yeah. So, um, Sue, would you like to talk? Ooh. Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, thank you for some really inspiring uh, talks. I just wanted to ask about. I was really taken with what Alex said about. Uh, carers as artists and artists as carers and that that was underpinned by James and the the Northwest Regional event where he talked about um artists as about an aesthetic of 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 care and I just wanted to ask how we can collectively grow an understanding of this that artists and how can artists and care professionals be more supported to do much more integrated work together I realize the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance and your, your group are very much advocating for that, but it, it, it just feels so very important. We'd like to address that. Alex? Hey. Thank Hello. you, I could say a couple of words. Um, I suppose what I'd be interested in is the way, uh, kind of what, what sometimes called social practice. So the, the skills of caregiving, relationship building, um, developing trusting relationships that's increasingly part part of the offer in training artists so there you know we have applied theatre degrees where the people on those courses are learning exactly the sort of things that uh, Madeline seems to be describing when she talks about the social pedagogy uh, development in, in Denmark so I wonder if it's if at least in the training of artists who are carers um that seems to be happening, um, but is it is it about taking some of those kind of learning approaches into other disciplines as we're trying to do by bringing the arts into the training of nurses? Um, I suppose what doesn't get encompassed in that are people who are informal carers and a lot of people come to care through informal routes, not necessarily through a degree. Nurses are rare in that, um, in that situation. Um, uh, but I suppose it's encouraging people to 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 think about how their own engagement with the arts and creativity and culture um, as forms part of their caring identity. And, and one thing I would strongly advocate is a kind of very broad idea of what arts and creativity is, because I think there's a danger of kind of white middle class people like me assuming that the arts you have to engage with are theatre and performance and opera and, and classical music, where actually there's a far broader range of arts and creativity that are more reflective of the brilliantly diverse um, communities who are involved in care, and, and that you. might help. Thank you, Alex. It's 5.30, sadly. Um, so I'd just like to thank our panellists very much indeed for a series of wonderful presentations, really instructive and inspiring, as so many in the audience have said, and thank our audience for participating and uh, I hope that we can stay in touch and I'm sure that we will all leave this event with, uh, with, with energized and inspired and, uh, and with renewed passion and leading to even greater effectiveness. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Lovely to see you, David. Yeah. Uh, when will... When will next be in the same physical space together? Well, I hope so.